Welcome to another episode of Beautiful, Bad and Bizarre. Today we're here in Eastbourne to visit the grave of the iconic Tommy Cooper. Born Thomas Frederick Cooper on the 19th of March 1921 at 19 Lewanon Street, Caerphilly in Wales. Apologies to any Welsh listeners for my pronunciation there. Tommy came into the world two months too early and was not expected to survive, but his mother Gertie had other ideas. A practical, no-nonsense woman, she made sure Tommy had everything he needed, not only to survive, but to thrive. Gertie's premature baby would grow into a six foot four adult. Gertrude Catherine Wright had been born in 1893 in Exeter. She was a strong-minded woman with a sense of business that was to keep the family afloat. Although she was rather a ditherer, a trait that her son would later make famous as part of his successful stage act. Tommy's father, Thomas Samuel Cooper, was born in 1892. On leaving school, he went to work in the Welsh mines. Sadly, his first wife had died during childbirth, just before the First World War. Generally speaking, Thomas was a happy-go-lucky man who loved singing and clowning around, making people laugh and being sociable. When young Tommy was three years old, the family moved to Exeter, where Gertie sent her son to prep school and then on to Mount Radford School. This was a fee-paying school, but Gertie worked hard and she was good with finances. She did many things to earn money, including making and selling ice cream from home, and she was also an excellent dressmaker and would eventually own her own haberdashery shop in Southampton. In 1929, when Tommy was eight years old, his Aunt Lucy on his mother's side of the family gave Tommy a box of magic tricks for Christmas. This would be a defining moment for the young Tommy and one that would contribute to making Tommy Cooper the legend. The gift absorbed all his attention as he practised the tricks, quite often none too expertly, but his humour always saved the day and he carried on trying. On the 10th of June 1930, Tommy's brother David John was born, but around this time Tommy's father, who'd been gambling with the family's money, literally gambled them out of house and home. As a result of this situation, the family relocated to the village of Langley in Hampshire, approximately seven miles from Southampton. Thanks to Gertie, things were to improve substantially to the point that the family were able to have their own bungalow built and Gertie took full control of the family finances. She was very strict with her husband, allocating him pocket money to bet on the horses. Growing up, Tommy continued with his obsession for magic tricks and would put on magic shows to entertain his parents. But he recalled performing tricks for them and asking, did you see how it was done? When his parents would respond with yes which would then cause the young Tommy to cry. Throughout his life, Tommy was a complete contradiction. He was reclusive, a loner and didn't make friends easily. But on the other hand, he loved entertaining people and lived for applause, revelling in being the centre of attention. The comedian and writer Barry Cryer once said of Tommy, in real life, he looked so singular and strange. He always seemed alone, even in the middle of a crowd. But once he got his opportunity and he had enchanted you with his piece of magic or convulsed you with a gag, all was right with the world. In 1935, Tommy left school aged 14 and began an apprenticeship with the British Power Boat Company in Hythe. His parents had contributed a financial premium for their son to be taken on, which was relatively commonplace back then. The starting pay was two and a half pence an hour. Tommy was known for disrupting the working day, entertaining his colleagues with new tricks. And on the occasion of the work's annual Christmas party, Tommy was desperate to show his skills as an expert magician. But every trick he performed went horrendously wrong. Tommy was devastated until he realised how much the audience were laughing even after he'd left the stage. It was at this point Tommy began to consider performing an act based on incompetence with some surprising elements of expertise thrown in for good measure. 
The job at the boatyard was never going to work out for Tommy. Despite being privately educated, he simply wasn't academic, neither was he suited to working in the boatyard. As it happened, the war gave him his opportunity to take a different path in life. Now, aged 19, in 1940, Tommy joined the Royal Horse Guards, and he found that he thoroughly enjoyed military life, and would spend his free time around the West End of London, visiting various magic stores, always on the hunt for novelties to impress his fellow soldiers. Towards the end of his time in the army, after being wounded by a gunshot to his left arm, he received an invitation to Cairo to try out for the army's travelling entertainment section. The audition went well and Tommy was soon entertaining the men and the women who'd stayed on after the war had finished in a peacekeeping capacity in the Middle East. It was while there that allegedly... On one occasion during a performance, Tommy had forgotten his regular army helmet and as a waiter walked past with drinks, Tommy pulled a crimson fez off the waiter's head and placed it on his own. From there on in, the fez became an important part of every stage appearance and even now the fez is associated with Tommy Cooper. It was also during this time that Tommy would meet his future wife, Gwendolyn Henty. Gwen was an accomplished performer in the Travelling Army concert party and the pair hit it off straight away and they fell deeply in love with each other. The couple got married while stationed in Cyprus in 1947. Tommy affectionately nicknamed Gwen Dove and for the rest of their life together, Tommy would call his wife Dove. Soon after their marriage, Tommy was demobbed and they set up home together in a house in Lavender Hill, Clapham, South London. Tommy wanted Gwen to join him in a double act, but Gwen was adamant that Tommy was very much a solo artist. However, she would give him her full support and she helped to push him forward when he began to doubt himself. When Tommy obtained his first audition with the BBC, the audition was a complete failure. He was described by an official in BBC Entertainment as having a nonchalant approach with poor diction and an unpleasant manner. He also said that Tommy had an extremely unfortunate appearance. Thankfully, this analysis was not shared with Tommy. Who knows what damage it could have possibly done to the future legend of British comedy if it had have been shared. In November 1947, after months of setbacks, Tommy attended an audition that was to change the course of his and Gwen's life forever. Tommy initially met George Miff Ferry at the Windermere Club on Regent Street in London. After hearing Tommy do some impressions, Miff asked him if he could do anything else as he hadn't been very impressed with the impressions. Tommy responded... Well, I do a bit of magic, you see. After Tommy began presenting his magic tricks, the band members, who had been taking a well-earned break in the orchestra pit, began roaring with laughter as Tommy started to do his tricks. Miff was impressed by the musicians' response because they've seen pretty much every act in the business and they did not laugh easily. Tommy was not only invited to perform at the club... He gained an agent that day in George Miff Ferry and the rest is iconic British comedy history. Although the artiste and the agent were to have a rather testing relationship at times, it worked for both of them. Despite their fallouts and their arguments, Miff remained Tommy's agent until the end of Tommy's life. December 1947 saw Tommy make his first television debut in the Leslie Henson Christmas Eve party. During the 1950s, Tommy was also working the London nightclub circuit with his magic, slapstick and gags. He gained the attention and the applause of the toughest audiences. Soon he was working alongside Benny Hill at the London Hippodrome and in 1953 he appeared in the Peep Show Review Tour. That same year, he and Gwen welcomed their first child into the world, their daughter, Victoria. 1954 saw Tommy appearing in Las Vegas and New York. He was also offered a season at Radio City Hall, 
but he had work commitments back in England, so he had to turn the offer down. Tommy Cooper's work diary was exhausting, unrelenting and full. In 1955, the Cooper family moved into 51 Barrowgate Road, Chiswick. I lived a stone's throw from the house in the 1970s, but sadly I never saw Tommy out and about. It now features an English heritage blue plaque. Gwen remained in the house until her death in 2002. The Coopers also had a second home in Eastbourne, which they purchased in the 1960s. On the 19th of January 1956, Gwen gave birth to their second child, a son, Thomas John Cooper. As an adult, Thomas would go by the name of Thomas Henty when he became an actor. He used his mother's maiden name in order to go into the acting profession on his own terms and not to be taken on for jobs just because he was Tommy Cooper's son. Sadly, Thomas was to die at the age of 32 in 1988 after complications of the blood disorder haemophilia, a rare condition that affects the blood's ability to clot. Thomas had separated from his wife and he left behind a six-year-old son called Tam. In 1957, Tommy accepted his own television series, Life with Cooper, for ATV. It was later to be renamed Cooper Armour. The show was a massive success. In 1958, he accepted another television series for ATV. This one was called Cooper's Capers. The work continued to roll in. Tommy was constantly faced with choices and was overwhelmingly loved by the viewing public as well as his fellow actors and comedians, including Eric Morecambe, one of Tommy's biggest fans, who was to say, I've never met anyone who disliked him as a man. If you didn't like him as a comic, then you didn't like comedy. Despite Tommy's full work diary, he always made it a priority to spend Sundays at home with Gwen, Vicky and Thomas. However, work tensions did cause elements of volatility in the household, with shouting matches occasionally, as Tommy himself once said, If you can't have a row now and again, one of you is unnecessary. Tommy was presented to Queen Elizabeth II on several occasions, including alongside Diana Dawes and Morecambe and Wise, on the 18th of December 1964 for a private performance at Windsor Castle to take part in the cabaret there for the annual Christmas party and ball, which was held for the staff and members of the royal family. Diana Dawes said Tommy went first and he had them rolling on the floor with laughter. Tommy had worked with Diana Dawes on a number of occasions and according to Tommy Cooper's biographer John Fisher who wrote Always Leave Them Laughing, you'll find details of the book in the description of this video. Tommy was always self-conscious when working with women and he found it impossible to have flirtatious chemistry with any of his occasional leading ladies. When Diana Dawes appeared wearing what was then considered a daringly low-cut dress on the Tommy Cooper London Weekend TV show in 1970, apparently Tommy found it difficult to achieve a rapport with her as he was frightened out out of his skull, according to Tommy's biographer, but less intimidated by another guest on the show, Thora Heard. I want some chops, but the, make them lean. And the butcher said, which way? <laughs> Tommy's popularity with the public never waned. He was very much loved and... As he became older, his shyness gave way to him becoming more sociable and outgoing in his personal life. Tommy became close friends with many of his fellow comedians and celebrities. Tommy and Gwen were known to enjoy a drink and unfortunately Tommy's drinking had been increasing with the pressure of work. By the 1970s Tommy reached the point where he simply couldn't go on stage without having his favourite tipple of brandy. He was also chain smoking cigars often at a rate of 40 a day. Tommy also became obsessed with his weight and began taking slimming pills along with tablets for insomnia while he was also suffering from a multitude of ailments including bronchitis, lumbago, sciatica and painful varicose veins and in 1965 Tommy experienced a minor heart scare. In 1969 Gwen and Tommy's marriage was under considerable strain. Both husband and wife could become very aggressive towards each other and their son Thomas said he hated any trouble with mum. 
She was more than a match for him. They had some colossal fights and Dad would spend all his time ducking. It was not helpful that Tommy had also begun an affair with Mary Kay, whom he'd met in 1967. Mary was a divorcee with a background in stage management for theatre and TV, and she was the perfect candidate for Tommy Cooper's personal assistant. However, Tommy found himself in the complicated situation of being in love with two women and not wanting to leave either of them. Gwen had stopped travelling with Tommy to a great extent. She was fed up with his insomnia and the hours he kept, and Mary was there to step in and offer support, and she had the energy to deal with Tommy's lifestyle. Amazingly, while all this chaos was going on in Tommy's private life, his popularity was going from strength to strength, although to an extent his performances were suffering as Tommy was becoming less and less reliable. By 1977, things had reached a peak. Gwen was talking about divorcing Tommy, but that year he had a heart attack prior to a show for business executives in Rome. Gwen rushed to be at her husband's side. The couple had an altogether tumultuous life, rowing, making up, throwing things at each other, and both were equally as bad as the other. Gwen once said, I threatened to leave him, but he's like an old pair of slippers. I've got used to him. We've had a marvellous life and we still kill ourselves laughing. By 1981, Tommy was attempting to get a grip on his problems. He'd cut down on smoking and alcohol, and during the last six months of 1981, he fulfilled 42 appearances in cabaret and theatre. But between New Year and March 1982, he'd made in the region of just six appearances. Sadly, despite his efforts to improve his health, Tommy Cooper died on Sunday the 15th of April 1984. He'd been appearing on London Weekend Television's live broadcast from Her Majesty's. Tommy was on stage going through the routine he'd practised to perfection. The audience were loving every minute of Tommy's act, laughing hysterically and thoroughly enjoying themselves. It was going so well until suddenly Tommy slumped down. The audience thought it was part of the act, but it wasn't. Tommy's microphone captured his gasping to breathe as the curtain was drawn quickly around him, but the show went on. Tommy's son, who was in the audience, had realised immediately this was not part of his father's act, and he rushed on stage. Gwen had stayed home that night. Tommy Cooper had died by the time they'd reached Westminster Hospital in London. The comedian Jimmy Tarbuck was presenting the acts that night. He remembered Tommy as being the comedian's comedian. Tommy Cooper died as he had lived, making people laugh. It was possibly the way he would have chosen to go, to the sound of great joy and happiness. Tommy Cooper's funeral took place at Mortlake Crematorium on Friday the 20th of April 1984. It was packed with celebrities of the highest calibre. His son Thomas said of his father's funeral, The house was full and that's the greatest tribute there could be to my father. It was reported that his son Thomas scattered Tommy's ashes among the daffodils in his garden that he loved so much. However, there is a family memorial here at Ockling Cemetery, Eastbourne, East Sussex, so I would assume only some of Tommy's ashes were scattered and the rest are interred here along with his wife Gwen's and their son Thomas's, who passed away in 1988. Behind their memorial is a headstone for Gwen's family, the Henty family. Tommy Cooper's stone reads, Rest in peace, greatly loved and sadly missed. Thomas Frederick Cooper, the 19th of the 3rd, 1921, to the 15th of the 4th, 1984. His son, Thomas John Cooper, 19th of the 1st, 1956, to the 13th of the 8th, 1988. To a unique mother, Gwendolyn Victoria Cooper, 1920 to 2002, cremated.
thank you so much for joining me here today in this step back in time to remember the life of the wonderful Tommy Cooper. I hope you enjoyed the video and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.